right up in the observer about your segment. Let's say Pritchard came out with his speech. Pritchard talked about how just a few years ago impact had so much hope, but it never happened. He said the TNA name is dead and the company will be known only as impact wrestling from this point forward. He said the company has a great hybrid wrestler as world champion and Lashley and that nobody could beat Lashley. And this was where Alberto came out and issued a challenge. Uh, Ethan Carter, the third also came out and said, there's no way Alberto deserved a title shot since he had never wrestled for the promotion and he wanted Lashley. Lashley blew him off saying he'd beaten him so many times. He didn't deserve a shot. So he would be facing Alberto. This is not the only title that's, uh, being discussed. Cody's going to come out, throw down his GFW, uh, next gen championship and says, he's not going to leave. He's trying to challenge moose this i don't know man this is a little weird um the idea that we've got a gfw championship and then ultimately they're going to have a match for what they're calling the grand championship moose and cody and cody's going to accidentally super kick one of the judges they bring you out to be a judge i don't know this feels like there's just a lot going on is that fair to say that would be an understatement. Uh, you know, they were trying to reestablish and catch you up on everything right off the bat. Right. So there were major changes that were taking place, and they, they wanted you to forget the 10-year history, or God, more than that, a history of TNA and make you think this is all brand new and this is this is where we're going instead of gradually letting it kind of take place. However, they felt that let's get it out there and, and let's start now. And the more things change, the more people are going to want to tune in and see what's next. Talk to me about, you know, you get your first set of tapings under your belt. You're almost in this GM type role. What's the experience like? I mean, uh, you know, I know that you're, even though on, on paper and in theory, you're only there to be an on-screen character, but you do wind up sitting in on some booking meetings, I'm sure. And there's a lot of other guys who might be agents there. Like, I don't know, maybe a Borash or a Shane Helms, or maybe an abyss. Talk me through, I think maybe even Dutch Mantel was there. Talk me through what that looked like at the time. Well, I think that there were, I know there still was some talent that kind of looked to me as being actually the real GM. Um, but the reason, my reasoning for going into the production meetings was so I could see what the hell I was going to do the next day. Mm. And I could get that shit in my head. And I'd go to the production meetings and, and just my ears would perk up when they got to my segment and I could ask questions there. And then I didn't have to really deal with anybody for the rest of the day until it was time to do my stuff. And the beauty of it was once the production meeting was gone and everyone would leave, that was my dressing room. So I left all my stuff in there. I would take out the computer and I'd do a little bit of work and, um, just hang, just kind of hang out. It wasn't like catering was a good place to hang out because food wasn't that good, but uh, I still had my connections at Universal Studios so I could sneak over to the car commissary and get good food, and I could still go and ride a couple rides during the day. <laughs> so, shit, man, my life was good. And, and I tried to, because with the new regime Dutch was, you know, a guy in charge, Jeff and all those with the new regime. I didn't want to be seen as trying to, to ruffle any of those feathers or, or anything like that. So I stayed away from it because guys would come up to me and say, Hey, what am I doing? What would you suggest? And I didn't know exactly what those guys wanted. So I stayed away. I stayed away from the young guys. I said, Hey, go talk to Dutch. Dutch knows exactly what you're doing in this segment. He knows where you want to go or go talk to Jeff or go talk to Al Snow or Pat Kenny. And I did my, did my thing. And then we'd go and do our pre-tapes, knock them out and do my live stuff. 
and they'd have a little shuttle van there for me to take me back to the hotel. So I was fuck. Well, what's the, what's the phrase? I shitting in tall cotton, something like that. Shitting in high cotton. There you go. High cotton, tall cotton, high cotton. Same thing. We got it. A uh, high cotton would, would that gives a connotation they were smoking marijuana or something. So I went with. Well, one of the things that uh, nobody cared about at the time. <laughs> Creative decides to have a feud with Jeremy Borash and Josh Matthews. And you actually come out and say that, Hey, we're going to have to settle this next week with a face to face. And, uh, you actually have a little bit of physicality in that segment. What do you remember about that? Who do I have physicality with? Well, you called me afterwards and told me that you'd taken a bump. Was that EC thrizzle when he threw me on the ground? That bastard. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You went and it hurt. I hadn't taken dude. Okay, you got to understand at this point, I hadn't taken a bump in 10 years at right. least. More. At least. More. More, probably. Yeah. And it's like, you know, you just you fall back into it, but uh, EC3 was supposed to basically just kind of knock me down, and he, he threw my ass, and it like, hurt i was sore i hadn't taken a bump in forever and i had to call my mommy i was gonna tell on him but no not only that you know this is a different deal for you you know i mean these are marathon tapings where we're going back to back to back and it's a long day you got the production stuff before you're up all late the night before with all those guys in the production meetings i mean prior to this i mean you're floating around your pool you know this is a, this is a, a different deal for you to be walking around on concrete and dress shoes all day, is it not? Yeah, that that was drizzling shit suit. Yes. Have, well, having to be dressed, sure, and wear a sport coat and things like that, and and that was challenging in and of itself. Because you folks, you got to understand, at this point in my life, I was a short and flip flop wearing dude, and wasn't really fond of a shirt and anything else on my body. So I just would hang out at the pool. I would go inside, do the podcast, kind of like I am right now in shorts and flip-flops and nothing else. I need you to visualize that. I have headsets on, talking into my microphone. But other than that, I just got a pair of boxers and some flip-flops on. So it makes it brings me back. See, it brings me back. And but now then I've got to go and I've got to put clothes on and I've got to walk around. I've got to perform and then I gotta go back and cool down and sit down and I gotta go walk around again and do shit. And then this son of a bitch throws me on the ground. And I just, yeah. I hurt for a few days off of a bump. Think about that. Off of a one. <laughs> one a singular singular bump that wasn't it was like yeah wasn't, it wasn't even a spectacular bump looked more like i just fell down which basically i did so yeah let's uh but, but josh and Jay, look hey really jb and josh probably had the hottest angle on the show I got to tell you, it is pretty interesting that the creative sort of is what it is. They're making Josh Matthews a heel. He's going to be trying to, uh, have a feud with, with Jeremy Borash. Wait, wait, wait. Let me make something very clear. They weren't making Josh a heel. Okay. He was a natural heel. Okay. Um, and he can't help himself, but on commentary, and I, I'm sure this is all the plan, but you know, he's rebelling against, you know, Karen and Jeff Jarrett and, you know, I mean, Jeff's not even appearing on screen at this point, but they are at making it clear that Karen is married to Jeff and he's going to make fun of the Jarrett's bringing in guys like Bruce Pritchard and Dutch Mantell. And he basically says the only reason the fans are even here at TNA is because they're too cheap to buy tickets to see NXT. I I don't, 
I mean, I guess we're, we're making an angle out of it's maybe an invasion. I don't know, but the idea that we're shitting our, our announcer is shitting on our fans saying, oh, they're, they're only here cause they're too cheap to buy tickets to the good show. W- what the fuck? Well, I mean, we were going with reality television. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's just like, wait a minute. This is the plan. What is this now? Yeah, I think that the idea was to look at what they had done in the past and yeah, and kind of go poo poo all over it and, and say, but what we're doing now is good. And, and that was kind of the idea about it. Don't ignore what, you know, don't ignore what's out there. Just, uh, embrace it and, and talk about it. 